My name is Elizabeth Oldfield and I will be your host for this evening. And I'm the director of Theos, I'm the host of the Sacred Podcast, and I am really, really pleased to see you here. We've been looking forward to this for a while. For those of you who are new to the podcast, it is a conversation about our deepest values, the stories that shape us and how we navigate our very deep differences. So take a moment to arrive. Some of you have been right on time in the waiting room, eager. Some of you have just put a child to bed or eaten your dinner or run from somewhere else um, in your home. So feel free to just take a breath, arrive into this slightly bizarre, but we hope life-giving collective experience. Get out of task mode, maybe hide your phone, close some windows on your device because we're gonna try and do something frankly enormous and slightly ridiculous, which might stretch us, which is reflect together on some big existential questions. And in some ways this might be easier on Zoom, a bit less intense, and it's definitely more accessible. But in another way, we might be having some feelings tonight that are hard to know what to do with in this kind of digital space. We might feel as we see the film and listen that we don't know the right answer to this, that it's too big for us. Maybe someone else on the call has a completely different idea of what a good life or a true life is, and we can't help feeling unsure about what that means. The questions we're asking and really only just beginning to take the lid off, obviously, tonight, can't help but be personal and deeply human. So we're going to try and keep this call as human and as honest and as safe feeling as a Zoom event can be. We are delighted to premiere tonight. She's an animation director with an MA in documentary animation from the Royal College of Art. And she also works alongside being creative designer at Theos as co-director of Studio Desk Animation Studio, which specializes in documentary animation. After I've spoken to Emily and we've watched the film, My Dream, My Taste, we're gonna hear from three big brained and big hearted human beings who we've asked really to just help us riff on the theme the film raises. What is a good human life or a true human life? And is there such a thing? Where might we look for answers? First up, in the theology corner, as it were, we have Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School, Miroslav Wolf. He's the founder and director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, author of myriad books and articles. You can go and research him yourself, but I would say that he is probably one of our most influential living theologians. And he's gonna to have to be because we've asked him to take on the ludicrous task of giving us in about 10 minutes, just a taste of how Christian theology might answer this enormous question. And you will immediately hear also that Miroslav is the voiceover of the film. Next, we have Julian Bergini, who is a philosopher and author, the co-founder of the Philosopher's Magazine and all round expert on how philosophy has sought to answer these questions, which is what we've asked him to speak to again tonight, again, in a ridiculously short amount of time. His most, re most recent book is called The Godless Gospel. And finally, Sarah stein Lebrano is a learning designer, content strategist and researcher at Oxford University, who studies political theory and its relationship to psychology. And for many, many years, she was the head of content at the School of Life. We've asked her to speak to some of the other ways, some of the other places we look to answer these deep questions of meaning. And so now over to Emily. My dream, my taste took inspiration from a quote on Miroslav's sacred podcast interview in which he mused on the way our modern understandings of the meaning of life, i.e. a quite individualized chasing after dreams and fulfillment can sometimes leave people feeling unconnected from bigger narratives. And as you'll see in just a moment, Emily follows the perspective of a young woman in a quite dreamlike fashion as she tries to have adventures and really jump levels in a video game world, but ends up quite isolated and disconnected. So I want to just kick off with a couple of questions for Emily. I'm gonna see if Abby's able to spotlight Emily so that we can uh, see her beautiful face. But if not, I think when you go to speak of you, you will uh, be able to see her. Emily, help us understand a little bit of your creative process. What made you choose this particular audio clip from all the episodes of The Sacred that we'd had up to that point? Um, hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so I was asked to create um, a short animated film based on a clip from The Sacred Podcast. And I was really drawn to this clip from Miroslav Volf's episode 
where he's talking about that pursuit for the good life and how that's become very privatized and insular rather than in community. And I was, I went to it, um, especially in terms of animation, because, well, firstly, because I did to it and I found that to be true of me and I, and in what I see of the world around me on social media and kind of society in general. And so I, I felt it was a really important topic, you know, like this idea that, yeah, when I fixate on so, so much on the good life for myself that I become, I lose the, the wider perspective and become disconnected from maybe the people around me. So yeah, that was the first reason why I was so interested in it. Um, but also, yeah, as I was listening to the clip, I instantly had loads of visual ideas coming to mind. And I, I think that concept of kind of the, the dream versus maybe the wider perspective um, is, is, yeah, really visually interesting as well. So talk to me about the visuals. Was it obvious that you would follow a character through this, this tension? And maybe what's your favourite little still or little moment in the film? Um, yeah, so I think... The visuals that came to mind when I when I was first thinking about this concept was very much sort of the fantasy world, video games, Instagram filters, those those aspects that kind of feed that desire for our world, our individual worlds to become more appealing and more attractive, but at the same time kind of disconnecting us from or stopping us from seeking the good of others. And I think, yeah, I one particular thing I was quite interested in in terms of um video games was the fit often in video games you know the, the the character is always at the center of the screen and the world revolves around that character and you you just follow wherever that that character goes and it becomes quite isolated <clears throat> um and so i'd made the decision that yeah in the film that that was going to be an aspect that i took forward so i wanted the character to kind of yeah just always be in the center and that world revolves around her until she kind of hits the realization and and things change and she's no longer necessarily the center, she's part of a, a bigger picture. Um, so those sort of ideas. Um, and I think my, my favorite bit is probably, um, there's a space scene, just because I, I always love space, but it's also kind of the moment of change, um, ultimate disconnection, but also kind of a desire to go back to where she came from. So, um, yeah. And what do you think, I'm gonna start that again because I have loved working on this with you and I am quite a wordy person and the work of Theos, which is the think tank which makes the sacred, the sacred is a project of Theos, often is engaging in this world of kind of public debates and public conversations. And even in that framing, it's very, it's very much words. And, you know, I'm sure um, Julian and Miroslav and Sarah also find this, that when we're trying to ask these big questions of life, it very easily, if we're not careful, slides into sort of debate or adversarial or um, a very intellectual, really, way of unpacking them. And I've really loved getting to know some more of the possibilities of the visual. What what drew you to it? Why do you think this kind of more artistic, creative, imaginative medium might help us as we try and ask these questions? Yeah, I think my favorite thing about animation is that you're creating an alternative world, but that world always represents the real world. And it means you're always communicating something about real life and, and real experiences. Um, and, you know, but but at the same time, it's not restricted to the properties of the real world so you know you can simplify it down to the core information but you can also exaggerate it and manipulate it and distort it in order to kind of draw attention to a really important point that you're trying to make or yeah something that particularly needs to stand out um and and i think you know animation has endless possibilities really it's, again it's not bound to those rules and so um yeah like you said visual metaphor is really powerful and actually sometimes that can help us process ideas or complicated information and especially when there's a voice in the film as well it can help to show something kind of more abstract or different to what the voice is saying but it can actually pair with it really nicely and help break that down um i think the other thing that's really great about animation is that um it can show the unseen as well so um it things like emotion thought and memory all those things you can visualize and bring another element another layer to to that, that experience of the film. And that worked really well for this film, for example, because you know it's a lot about blurring the lines between a dream or reality and um, how th those worlds can interchange quite easily. Um, so that, that was quite good for this film. Um, and then the final thing I would say on that question is that 
yeah, because animation is always a representation of the real world, it's not claiming to be reality, um, at least not 2D animation. But um, I think that can often help us put ourselves and our experiences into what we see on screen more. Um, because if you, you know, alternatively, if you're so showing a specific actor in a specific part of the world with a specific age and gender and race, um, it, yes, we can maybe still relate to what they're, the story that they're showing, but they're still separate to us. Um, and so, whereas if you have kind of a simplified character in a world that could really be many parts of the world, um, it, we might start to put our own experiences and our own self into what we see. Um, and so I think that's why it's, it can be really great for dealing with these big questions and um, not just kind of entertainment and fiction. It can, it can help us kind of, yeah, ask those questions and, and think about them for ourselves. Emily, thank you so much. So we are going to screen the film. This has been obviously tech tested to absolute death from our end. And so we're very confident that it will be streamed over very high speed internet, that it will be the best quality that we can possibly achieve. However, it is a relationship. And sadly, if your internet connection at your end is not very strong, um, it might still look a bit jerky to you. So you'll see in the chat, there's a link to the YouTube channel. Um, if after a few seconds, you think actually this isn't um, streaming that well for me, then just minimize the Zoom window, stay stay with us, um, but minimize and mute the Zoom window, and then you can go and watch it on YouTube and come back. It's two, it's two and a half, three minute film. And directly following the film, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna play a track, we're gonna play the new sacred theme music, which I um, adore. And we're going to give you some time really to just sit with it. So maybe grab a pen and paper. I am a big fan of the analog in, um, in helping us think. Um, Feel free to put some thoughts in the chat if you'd like. It will be opening again after the film if you're an external processor. But we just want to create a little bit of space for you to see what comes up from the film, what your responses are, and just take a beat. And directly after that, I'm going to be handing over to Miroslav, who will be tackling that big question from the perspective of theology.
Wonderful. I'm going to hand over now to Professor Miroslav Wolf, uh, who's going to share some thoughts. Uh, we'll continue to hear more of his mellifluous tones as he shares what maybe he thinks Christianity has to say about the questions that he raised in there. Elizabeth, thank you so much. And Emily, thank you also for this wonderful um, uh, film. I feel so honored to be um, and grateful to be part of it. Also, to be great, I'm grateful to be part of this, uh, this launch. And um, as the film illustrates so well for many, a vision of the good life is not a matter of truth or of falsehood, but of individual preference and of taste. So in the domain of purposes and values, we feel that we are often free to follow simply our dreams, provided we do no harm to others. Indeed, I think even more, we feel that if we didn't follow our dreams, we would betray our authentic humanity. So good life is private, personal matter, but the important part of it is that preconditions for the good life, we think, is not so private uh, and personal matter. Secure the resources you might need for living your dream, whatever that dream might be. This is the overriding imperative of modernity, or so writes the sociologist Hartmut Rosa. Whatever you choose as your vision of the good life, you will be better off if you have accumulated economic, social, cultural, symbolic, bodily capital. In other words, if you are rich, well-educated, well-connected, and good-looking. From kindergarten to hospice, learning how to secure resources and going about securing them claims most of our time and most of our energy. But I think something is off. We feel that something is off with this account of the good life and its relation to the resources we need to secure it. Rosa expresses what's wrong with it with the help of an image. He writes, in a way, we moderns resemble a painter who is forever concerned about improving his materials, the colors and the brushes, the air condition, the lightning in studio, the canvas, the easel, and so forth, but never really starts to paint. Now, Christian faith is about resources for life, too, about food, about clothing, about shelter, about health for all humans. Whether we care for the hungry, sick, exposed, and powerless, or fail to do so, will largely determine the verdict of the ultimate judge on our lives. Things we need to survive and thrive are in fact part of the good life, flourishing life, not just a resource for it. But these things are also only a part of flourishing life. Christian faith is above all about what matters more than the resources we need to survive and to thrive. It tells us that a good life is the pearl for, each, for which it is worth selling any resource we might have, wealth, power, know-how, good looks, or fame. With that pearl, we receive back improved much of what we've sold to acquire it. Without that pearl, we ourselves are diminished and sometimes lost, and none of the things we refuse to sell in order to acquire it can make up for the damage. Shifted me to one of the scenes in the gospel. It is a tempter devil who says to Jesus, who was famished after a 40-day fast in the wilderness, and he says, the tempter says, turn these stones into bread. Jesus resists responding, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that, that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, Jesus is quoting here Hebrew Bible. These words came first to the children of Israel in the course of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and before entering the promised land. They did need bread in the wilderness, bread standing here for all the resources we need for life. But they needed more than bread. And that truth, which is not so obvious as the growling stomach, but as real as the possibility of squandering our very lives, that lesson they did need to learn. All humans do. Perhaps 
especially we moderns do. Now, we moderns have made what was Jesus' temptation into a chief goal of our lives and the main purpose of our major institutions, whether economic, political, educational. Most of our social and individual energy and imagination revolves around turning stones into bread. And yet, we both, the rich and the poor, are still in the wilderness, plagued by hunger and thirst. For when we live by bread alone, this is the conviction of the Christian faith, there's never enough bread, not even enough when we make so much of it that mounts of it rot away. When we live by bread alone, someone always goes hungry. When we live by bread alone, every bite we take leaves a bitter aftertaste. And the more we eat, the more bitter the taste. When we live by bread alone, we always want more and better bread, as if the bitterness came from the bread not tasting good enough, rather than actually from our living by bread alone. But why want bread alone? Why want the unending stream of truly amazing goods and services we generate with such incredible ingenuity? Why want all of this still our hunger and open us up to delight? Perhaps we just need to make work meaningful. Perhaps we just need to make pay fair wages to meet basic needs. Economic justice of this sort would help immensely. And I think it's a commandment to, for, for us to do it. And yet, even with justice secured, joy may elude us. Let me try to make that plausible, that last comment plausible. Affirmation of ordinary life. That is to say, celebration of work, of friendship, of just ordinary everyday pleasures is one of the central features of the modern era. Paradoxically, perhaps, a central problem of that same modern era is the alienation of the world from the self and of the self from the world. As one would expect, reasons are complex. Reification, to use the technical term, turning everything into manipulable things and commodities is one of them. Competitiveness is another one of them. But I want to zero in on the loss of gratitude. Now imagine with me a world in which we have deeply meaningful work, perhaps a garden to keep and to till if we are into agriculture and horticulture. Relations with our family and friends could not be better. Anybody, nobody is there to boss us around. No structure is there to impose itself on us like some iron cage. Imagine also that the land is fertile the climate mild, and we live in abundance. In such an environment, joy would come unbidden. Now imagine that in that paradise, there's a tree bearing what seems to be exceptionally attractive fruit, but we are hindered, hindered from eating it. That one tree desired all the more because the access to it is barred and the taste of its fruit is somewhat unknown. That one tree now becomes for us the pearl of the great prize. Economist Thomas Sedlacek has made the story of Adam and Eve a lesson in the impossibility of joy. I'm not sure that impossibility is the right word, but the difficulty of joy can be put this way. We can be in paradise and still be deeply malcontented. For every paradise we can think of has in it an inaccessible tree with amazing looking fruit. Whatever we think is paradise will undo itself if we fail to genuinely celebrate the good that it represents and only stretch ourselves toward things we do not yet have things that are not yet. Someone may object. Let's not invoke paradise so soon. Many people live today in an earthly hell while watching a few wallow in paradisiac opulence. 
create first the paradise for all, the objector may continue, and we'll deal with the problem of joy once we're in it. Understandable as the objection is, it misses the point. One of the things, just one thing, but crucial thing, one of the things that prevents anything like paradise from appearing in the first place is the inability to celebrate the goodness on the road to it. Just think of it. Our economy is largely joyless. Our education, I'm part of it, is largely joyless. Our politics are joyless. Our entertainment, though full of wonderful humor, is joyless. Even our pleasures, intense and many as they are, are largely joyless. In all these spheres, we fail to rejoice in the goods that are already ours because we cannot find our way to appreciate and be grateful for what we have. We rejoice over things we perceive as good and which come to us unowed. It is a basic Christian conviction that our world, even our flawed world, is a good gift from the God of love. When we receive that world and all the good in it as a gift, then we rejoice. And that is a sign that we are beginning to live a good life. At least that is what I think. Thank you so much. Marislav, thank you. Julian, we are over to you to give us a taste of some of the ways philosophy has sought to tackle these questions. Uh, thanks so much. It's, it's, it's great to be here and good to see so many people here taking the time to think about this very important issue. I think it's true that a lot of people today do find the idea of the good life that's been sold to them to be somewhat shallow and empty and unsatisfying. The idea that what you should be doing is simply buying new pleasures, consuming new experiences, pursuing your own private good is something which I think leaves a lot of people ultimately unsatisfied, exciting though the trip may sometimes be. And given that, it's very natural, I think, for people to say, well, if this isn't enough, then uh, the good in life has to be found in something else, something bigger, something greater, something perhaps higher. But I think what philosophy has really taught us is, first of all, that that's actually a, a mistake. It's a mistake to look for the good in life outside of life which of course is something which I don't think all religions teach us, by the way, but some versions of religion do. But I think it also is perfectly adequate to explain why the kind of good life we have today is unsatisfactory. It can be explained, I think, in naturalistic and philosophical terms. So I think to understand this, we have to go back to someone like Aristotle, or I think really set out the template very clearly. He asked, what is the good life for a human being? And he said, to answer that question, what you really have to identify is what is good in itself and what is not merely a means to an end. That which once you have it, it is worth having for its own sake and not merely for something else. So that's clearly why money isn't the ultimate good because the only use of money is what money can get. But other things we do think are good in themselves, things like say, love and so forth. And interestingly, I think the things that make life good and not necessarily things that last, that are eternal. They can be fleeting. Sometimes if you just have the joy of watching a beautiful sunset, as I'm almost doing from my room here, then you know that is something which is worthwhile. It is valuable. The fact that it doesn't last, it doesn't make it less valuable. It can make the experience perhaps more poignant. It can give you that kind of bittersweet feeling, but the value is there, it's there in life itself. And I think once you start to look for meaning or purpose or goodness beyond life, then in a sense, you're always sort of postponing, you're, you're putting off what that good is. So obviously, for example, if one thinks that the, the, the good life is the life to come rather than the life we have now, you're merely postponing the question of what makes life good. You're just assuming that somehow it will be better in a life to come than it is now. But if a life to come is to be good, it must be because there is a form of living which is worthwhile in itself. 
And there's no obvious reason why that form of living can't be found in this life rather than one to come. Purpose is another thing people say, well, the good life has to be a life of purpose. But purpose, again, it's actually sort of taking the value away from the thing itself to what it is serving. The purpose of a knife is to cut bread. The knife doesn't have any value in itself. Its, its value is entirely to do with what it can do. And the danger of thinking that the, the good life is to be found in getting, giving oneself one kind of purpose is in a way we instrumentalize our own lives. We think that our lives exist for something else rather than having value in themselves. So I think that the, the broadly secular philosophical answer to the good in life is what makes to find out what makes life good, we have to find what are those things which are valuable in themselves, where it makes no sense to ask, well, why is that good? And here, perhaps, you know, words don't do it enough. You, you know those things from the experience of them. You know, if you are, for example, in the company of people you love, and that is good, and someone says, well, why is this good? There is a way in which they just simply haven't attended properly to what is going on, because if they did, they would notice that it was good. Now, the problem is that if we are to find the good in this life and this life only, then the evidence seems to be that often that leads people down alleyways and routes which they find empty and shallow. The idea of just chasing your own dream, doing something just purely your own taste, being on the hedonic treadmill or going from one thing to another. But secular philosophies have explained why this is inadequate. They've explained that whatever the good life is, it can't simply be the pursuit of things like pleasure or happiness because these things are by their nature fleeting. And if you just simply make the pursuit of an experience, a nice experience, the, the meaning of your life, then that isn't uh, going to be enough. Um, similarly, you might say, so So what, so in, in, instead, the vision Aristotle offers is, if you read translations of Aristotle, it's often said that he says the, the happiness is the ultimate good. It's, that's not true. His term is eudaimonia, which is flourishing. The good life is a life in which one flourishes and flourishing involves happiness and pleasure involves the good things in life but it also means living authentically as a human being living to your full potential as a human being and again that provides a kind of objective element to life the reason why it's not good enough simply to pursue your own desires and so forth is that there is a sense in which the flourishing life is not merely for us to determine the flourishing life has to be one which genuinely does justice to our humanity. And it's because we think a flourishing life is so important that actually people of faith and not of faith want to help the sick and they want to help the poor because those things inhibit flourishing. Aristotle didn't use the phrase, but he would have entirely agreed with the idea that man cannot live by bread alone. Because the point about living by bread alone is that's a meaningful life for him, for the other animals. An animal is simply concerned with nourishment and living and reproduction. What makes us human is that we have needs that go beyond that. And one of the things I think that it goes beyond is the fact that we are social. It involves living in relation to others. And that is why, again, a purely selfish pursuit of the good life cannot be a good life. Because human beings cannot flourish completely separate from others. So the secular philosophical sort of sketch of the good life is an outline. How you fill it in is difficult and it's complicated. It perhaps does vary somewhat from person to person, but it's finding what's good in itself in this life. And it's flourishing, not just as an individual, but flourishing in community with others. And to do that, you have to do it in the spirit of gratitude, of cherishing the moment and of joy, and of not simply grasping for the next thing. And that's one of the things that modern society has certainly uh, made difficult. It's made us grasping. It's made us in a, unable to be too grateful because it's always selling us the next dream. But that's not an inherent limitation of finding a good life in secular mortal terms. It's a problem of modernity. So I think that within a secular philosophical perspective, we have a framework for a good life, which interestingly enough, when you look at what it actually entails for how we live, actually overlaps quite a lot with a lot of religious views of the good life because it's about being the best person you can it's about living with others and it's about not just satisfying your own desires and not just living an animal life thank you
Julian, I'm going to be very mean and bring you to a close for the sake of guarding some time for questions. Um, Sarah, over to you. Uh, thanks, Liz. It's really nice to be here. And there are just two things that I want to talk about, which are neither Christianity nor philosophy writ broadly. One is the pragmatic things that secular people look for, uh, or many secular people look for. And I'm familiar with this because for many years, I was the head of content at a strange little place called the School of Life. You may have seen our YouTube videos. And the focus of the School of Life is, is actually on eudaimonia, on flourishing. We used the word fulfillment in English. Um, as our mission statement for a long time. And primarily what we did in addition to our films is provided workshops uh, for people to come together and discuss this kind of thing. And we actually have a class called The Meaning of Life, which I helped design and tested uh, for years. At the beginning of the class, there's a bit written by my boss where he hypothesizes that we've lost the big old fashioned structures of the meaning of life. He says there's so many fewer people are religious in the West um, the nation state is no longer a source of meaning uh, and politics, the class struggle in particular, no longer carries as much meaning as it used to. And my reflection first is that I'm not sure either of these three things are completely true, being of a different generation than he is. But in any case, the class then turns uh, to suggest that there are at least six sources of meaning um, and it goes through them like a buffet and asks people to think about their relationship to it. And I think one of the first things to say is that many of these sources of meaning are meaningful for the people who attend precisely because they are not individualistic. So they include things like service, belonging and connection, uh, which people have not previously been able to source for themselves. So there's a discussion of how could I achieve more of this in my life? How could I achieve more of that? In one sense, it is this still buffet of options, but in another sense, it at least brings people back uh, towards others. And indeed, a lot of what the School of Life does ends up serving the same kinds of functions that religion does for people. It's noticeable that our uh, most beloved group activity at our many conferences is called confessions and people come and confess in a booth with others um, that it serves a ritualistic purpose and so on. And there's also a big discussion of suffering, which is a theme in, of course, so many religions. So that's, that's one thing I want to talk about. And I think it's also worth saying that at the same time, we're always grappling with people's ambivalence about the things in their life that they think should bring them meaning, but which often can't. In particular, there's a lot of pressure on jobs and on romantic partners to bring meaning. And um, one of the very first things that we have to do as facilitators and teachers in this environment is tell people that they might have actually placed too much meaning there that we can't expect from another person that they're going to be a perfect match for us, that our life will be complete once they enter it, uh, that romantic love might even be a sort of 17th century invention from romanticism, and that we might possibly be being promised too much from bourgeois capitalism in terms of what a job can provide for any human being. This is a hard sell and not everybody is interested, but I think it's worth saying that people really struggle with this. So we are also potentially suffering from several unhelpful myths. And, um, and I'm highly aware of that even now. I still see the faces of the people in the classroom having watched these sessions many times. And I think about them a lot because I think they say something about what even the people who have all the ingredients of a happy life don't have in terms of meaning. But the other thing I want to talk about is politics. And I say this not only because I'm a political person at heart in so many ways, but also because I research political theory at Oxford University, where I'm studying a peculiar phenomenon, one that draws us into cults and conspiracy theories, but happens to all of us, called cognitive dissonance. Many of you may have heard this term on the internet, and I'm not going to be able to explain to you in the next three minutes exactly what it entails. Um, but essentially, it's a form of discomfort when we discover that there's a rupture in our map of meaning in the world, when we discover a contradiction in our own actions and our beliefs. And what I think is wonderful about cognitive dissonance, even though it causes these problems for human beings, is that it shows that we are not just homo economicus. We're not just looking out for the next benefit here and there. We suffer, we suffer deeply. We experience pain that psychologists say is akin to hunger and thirst when we notice that something is wrong with the meaning that we've made out of the world and our sense of ourself within it. In fact, people experience cognitive dissonance most, not only when something about the world has a contradiction, not only when maybe their sense of meaning is challenged, but in particular, when they're facing a challenge related to their sense of self, 
and particularly to the sense of self as a good person. We most struggle to change our beliefs if it threatens our sense that we're good. And of course, this is true, unfortunately, of people that we might all think are abhorrent, like white supremacists. Um, but nevertheless, I find this very helpful and reassuring when I look at how politics works, because it tells me that the economist's vision of happiness as utility maximization is not the only kind of happiness that human beings seem to inherently hold on to. We also want to be agents for good in whatever sense we can. Uh, so I try very hard to convince other political theorists, not only that they should tend to this strange part of psychology, but that they should return to think about what people are trying to get out of politics in general. And I think what they're trying to get out of it, and of course, not just out of politics, but also out of religion and communal life, is a sense that there's a map of meaning, that they know what they can do in that map of meaning to be an agent for good, and maybe even that they can occasionally share it with other people. I agree with uh, Miroslav Wolf that uh, too much of this is privatized. And so part of our frustration, our screaming and yelling at each other on Twitter is, is that we have created maps that are very individualistic. And then when we run into other people's individualistic maps, it causes us literal, almost physical pain. And I'm very curious about how we can reduce that just enough that we can begin to listen to one another. And um, there are some interesting bits of research on how to do this, but I think one of the main things that I've been holding on to when I encounter someone with whom I deeply disagree or who seems very uncomfortable is just to think about how at heart they probably would like to have a map of meaning in their life, even if I don't agree with how they've mapped it out. Sarah, thank you. Miroslav, Julian, thank you. That is the formal end of tonight. Thank you again, Miroslav, Emily, Sarah, and Julian.